Okay, we are live back here with uh, City Council Jeff McLaren. And today, this time since uh, our meetings have been stopped because of the pandemic, uh, we're going to go through an old, uh, an older text that uh, we covered uh, like three, four years ago. What yeah, pretty close. Yeah, well, this was uh, uh, Marilyn Waring and her book, uh, If Women Counted a Feminist a new a new feminist economics or something like that that's right. um yeah uh, this was um it's a thinker it's a good one um so uh, i it's, it's one of the ones i remember well actually because uh, it, it definitely made you made you think um, and you learned a lot from it <coughs> about how the world works so let's get to it okay so uh she is in fact credited as being the founder of feminist economics and uh the book starts off with the question of who is productive, and she gives four examples and asks us to choose. So in the first example, she refers to a girl named Tendi, a young African girl who spends about 18 hours a day getting and carrying wood and fire, firewood and water and preparing, cooking food and cleaning and babysitting. She asks, is she productive? Then she asks Kathy about Kathy, who is a middle class North American housewife who spends her time providing cleaning food preparation and education and other services to her family. Is she productive? And then she considers Ben, who she describes as a US military specialist who get, has a high paying job and spends his days sitting in a silo waiting for an order that hopefully will never come to launch a nuclear ballistic missile at Russia or some other country. And then she also considers Mario. The fourth example is Mario, who she describes as a pimp and a heroin addict. And she asks us, which of these four are productive? All of them. <laughs> She's going to disagree with that. Now, what she says uh, starts off saying that in our world, the first two, Tendi and Kathy, are not productive. They're right. Not, they're not paying taxes, for example, uh, or if they are, they're they're not really producing any money. They may be anyway. The, from their from her perspective, they're not considered. Sorry, from the world's current perspective, they're not considered productive. She points out that the two men, Ben and uh, Mario, are in fact productive according to the system that counts what's productive and what's not. Then she points out that the two women are actually doing something that's useful and meaningful for society, whereas the other two are parasites on society. <laughs> they're in fact destroying the world. Um, and they're uh, how, productive. How is, how is Mario productive and how is Mario like uh, counted in this economy? So uh, because he, there's money exchanged. So it can be counted. Value for value is measured in money in this world. Right. So that's all that, even if it's in the black market. Even if it's in the black market, yes. Gotcha. Okay. In fact, uh, national accounts actually ca account for the black market and gray markets, but not so much stuff that doesn't account for uh, transfers of um, funds. And okay. we'll see that that's an accident of history. Okay. Okay. So she starts off by pointing that out that uh, what women do isn't counted isn't essentially valued in our system, and it's absolutely necessary for the survival of our civilization. What men do, in many cases, in her two examples, are not necessary. However, they are valued and vi valued in many cases very highly. And in some cases, right. I mean, <laughs> it's basically waiting to destroy the world. <laughs> so she sees that there's a um, there's an irony there, a, uh, a very dark irony. and. Uh, this is the world we live in. Um, these are the rules that are set up and they are set up, she claims, by men to measure the national accounts. The national accounts uh, for her um, are a very specific thing. Um, so normally we think that when money is exchanged for value uh, and value and value. So I buy something, say a car, um, it's valued at the money that I have and we exchange. That's how, uh, that's how it works in our world, but it's not true. It's better to say that money is exchanged for what men think is valuable and that people need a motivation to do. Need a motivation to do. To oh, do. right, right, yeah. so that so, they wouldn't do otherwise. Precisely, money is a tool to motivate you to do things that you wouldn't do for free. Isn't that, isn't that a good thing, Jeff? <laughs> Don't we wanna get people to do, do, do work? that uh, they wouldn't otherwise do? Well, let's consider what don't kind need, of work that is. Don't you need that incentive? Yeah, to sit in a silo and wait to destroy the world? Absolutely. Right. 
that's which well so she doesn't say that's necessarily a bad thing to do that but in this system yes it's extremely bad so um a corollary is that uh, money is needed to motivate people to do dumber and less important things than what people will also do because people will do what is important for free so child care for example you see your child i mean you're going to take care of them whether somebody pays you or not right right but you want to sit in a you want to sit in a bunker in front of a television or in front of a TV screen typing out memos to somebody? No, they're going to have to pay me to do that. Right, of course. Right, which is the average job that you see. Or sorry, I guess it's the average uh, white-collar job in front of a computer, right? Uh, so this is, this is the perspective from life, she says, that uh, feminist economics brings. And if you don't consider this life perspective... Um, you're going to continue with the system because you can't imagine something different. And there are a lot of things much more important than just merely exchange value of things and motivating people to do things they wouldn't normally want to do. Life perspective. Yes. What, what, and we're going to see what, what you... well, uh, we'll get into that next okay. time because uh, we'll talk about uh, the life market and uh, how it's absolutely necessary for capitalism to exist. Um, but that's, that's a hint of where we're going with that. Right. Okay, so um, after, descri after describing that uh, there is this thing called the uh, national accounts, um, she, she says, how is this possible that nobody's really noticed this? And uh, she's claiming that math and propaganda make it possible. And it's particularly numbers at the th service of theory and abstraction, giving an unwarranted legitimacy to the theory and its abstractions. It's also propaganda in which the notion of the male experience encompasses the female experience and therefore renders the female experience. Because I mean, if we think of what men do, women can do that too, right? So don't worry about what women do because it's not important. Just let's look at men. Now, does she have a concept for, you know, why this division of men's work and, and women's work exists, whether it's either biological or social or, you know, class-based or, it's probably a bit of all of that. Um, she'll get into that. Also, we'll do that in the second turn, a second session of this. Uh, not so much today, but um, it's it's so, uh, it's in the tax code. It's in the census. It's in the way census censees are are run. Uh, it's in the notion of the household. household uh, yeah. Uh, so, and we'll get into all of this. So, it, it's it permeates our society uh, and the world, in fact, uh, in ways that um, are almost beyond conception in the sense that we just think of it as natural. And by the way, she wrote this in 86, so there have been some changes, but they've been tweaks to the system rather than wholesale changes. Uh, so we haven't really advanced very far in, her, in my estimation of what she would say today. Okay. Okay. So uh, an example that she gives is the development of washing machines, dishwashers, and microwave. All of this has allowed women who do most of the housework to also be able to work outside the home. Mm, yes. So this housework is now done more effectively, efficiently, but they're not in, the productivity is not rec, rec, there's no recompense for the productivity increase. No, they just have, they just are freed up now to to work outside money. the house. Yes, yes. in the, uh, in a different way in in a way that men would normally do it. Um, so, but what this also has done is it basically has uh, actually increased men's leisure time, not women's, because women have to now do the housework plus go outside and work. Men can come home and relax. And before they couldn't? Well, and, uh, and before they may have had to work a little harder. So the more, because they have, uh, because if both men, uh, if both the husband and the wife are working, there's more income. Right. Right. But the woman is still working more. I, or <laughs> she's more productive because she can do housework and work outside the house. Men don't do that. It's just not part of our society. It's yeah. culture, right? So another example, she says, um, of how this uh, men's work can multiply easily and uh, take over things is the failed challenger mission. It was an economic success because it added billions of dollars to the U.S. economy. But do you see something wrong with a failure adding to the national the benefits of the national accounts and national accounts by the way are we're talking GNP at her time GDP now that's right. the that's the final measure of it 
Um, what else goes into the account, uh, the, the measurements of national accounts? Uh, well, we'll see that in the next time to be more precise, but as a hint, um, it is the exchange, uh, any monetary exchange at the, in the market. Okay, that's all, that's all counted, and that's the only thing that's, that's the only thing that's counted, yes. And we'll see that it wasn't always that way, uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so, no, that, that is for, uh, discerning or uh, concerning that, uh, that a failure of that magnitude can be considered a plus in terms of our accounting. Of the oh yes, and we'll see. There's a there's a few there's a whole bunch more like that. <laughs> um, so it, it's the concept of value that is at stake here. Value in economic theory is equivalent to price, yeah. but it's not in the real world. In the real world, only a very small portion <clears throat> of value can be con circumscribed by price. Um, work and productivity are similarly valued by their connection to price. But again, price is a small component of the actual value in the world. Uh, so there's no account for the fact that most of our time is spent not working and not being productive. So in this sense, um, in the sense of exchange or effort for money. So um, what's the value of our friendship? I don't think I've ever paid you to be my friend. And I don't think you've no. done that. So, so far, no. So far, no. <laughs> but there is value there, is there not? There's value. Yes. So that's not counted. And so she's pointing out that if you value friendship, it's not <laughs> yours to pay for. And if it is, it's really, we don't really consider real friendship, right? Right. And this is an example of, of, uh, of not counting what's really valuable in the world. Consider a clean environment. How much is clean air worth to you? It's worth that, a lot, I would say. <laughs> it's perhaps valued beyond money. Um, so how do we count that? Well, the only way to do it is to get it dirty and then figure out how much um, effort and value is needed to fix it. Uh, okay, so we have to break it in order to to, to give it some some monetary value. So yes, that, and that, that monetary so value is only the fixable <laughs> cost to bring it, the remediation cost. Mm. Not necessarily, like it depends on how badly you damage it, right? So if you so, nuke a place, it's going to be more expensive to fix than if you just, you know, throw some tires on the ground. So like like healthcare, for example, mental health, yes. the mental health epi epi <coughs> epidemic everyone's suffering from in late capitalism um, because of the things we've broken. We've broken our social systems and, and minds. Yes. So how much is a, is a healthy mind worth to you? Well, let's break it and find out how much we can pay in psychiatrist fees uh, and drug fees and this kind of stuff. And hey, that's how much it is to you. But uh, she would say that's just that's that's a crazy way to look at it, but it's the only way that our system actually allows it to be counted. The same is true for safety, uh, for life. You may have heard that there are um, that uh, insurance companies and actuators often <coughs> calculate the value of a life in monetary terms, right? And I believe in the Ford Pinto crisis, I think it came to like three hundred thousand dollars at the time. So. Jesus. What it meant was that for their calculations, if we can, if it costs more than three hundred thousand dollars to fix the Ford Pinto, um, and we only have to pay that out, say we expect maybe ten times uh, in the next ten years, then we won't recall it. She says, right. no, that's "Crazy! That's well, that 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 pattern of thought is forced upon us, as we'll see shortly, um, by the system itself." It's backwards. And, it's exactly backwards, yes. And uh, yeah, so we just talked about uh, family life, <coughs> safety, uh, the environment. These are all improperly measured in price terms, uh, but that's the only way that the, the system can actually deal with them. So she goes on to say that <coughs> if we actually were to measure value, which she points out is overwhelmingly set by men, in terms of price or exchange value, as, Mark, as Marx would call it, then a trend is created that tries to put a price on everything yeah. that, men, that men do. In the past, it has been assumed that markets create a trend to put a price on everything. She's claiming, no, this is not true. Rather, it's only on the things that men do. Otherwise, women would also be counted in the market, and they're not, and they've been doing that work longer than we have. Interesting. The reaper. So, yeah, reproduction of society by women, child rearing has been around since prehistory. Everything that we do as men has come afterwards, and that's what's valued. So this, right. this notion that the, the, 
that the market wants to put a price on everything, she says it's not true. It wants to put a price on everything that men do. And the, thing, the more things that men do, the further the market expands. But couldn't we imagine a society where men did, do, did different things? And yes, oh, absolutely. Things? Um, and we might imagine that towards the end, but not today. Okay. So, uh, again, so the yeah, remediation of polluted land is an example. The challenger is another example. Uh, the fear and threat of a market society is really the expansion of what men can do for remuneration more than into more and more domains. That's what she's claiming. So, so war, war must factor into that too. Yes, uh, war is, in, is is genuinely a male activity. Well, but I mean, it's also a, a mess you make in order to. I mean, uh, nobody made more money off the Iraq War than you know all the contractors friendly with Bush and Cheney. Yes, that's right. <coughs> yes. and yeah, it's predominantly men. Yes, right, but. I mean, could, couldn't we imagine women? I mean, Thatcher. I don't know. She personally gained from it, but I'm pretty sure that uh, Dick Cheney did. No, but Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher went to war with the Falklands, and I'm sure oh. there was some money made there. Yes, okay. So, um, yes, and she probably would have known about that because this happened before she published this book. That was in 81, wasn't it? Yeah. The Falklands War. I think it was, was published in 86. 82, maybe 83? Anyway, uh, somewhere in there. Anyway, this came, it wasn't after he said, I know that much because I'm sure I was uh, 86. I was in high school and I was not in high school when the Falcons War happened. 82. 82. There we go. So um, I suspect that she would be an exception to the rule. Actually, she's going to, uh, Marilyn Waring, Waring will uh, be talking about women economists and what blinds them and how they're blinded. Uh, actually, I think we'll talk about that today. So we'll see that it probably applies to Margaret Thatcher as well since. Now, it sounds a little bit essentialist on her part, that there's something essential about womanhood that makes them um, not have these characteristics that men do. Um, or that there's something essential about men that um, yeah. makes them not want to be part of productive or reproductive labor? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, no, but she doesn't really get into that. So um, for her, she looks at biological determinism as... Um, as a justification, but not as a reality. So okay. uh, biologically deter uh, biological determination was a justification for male control over women um, because, you know, men are visibly stronger so they can dominate women. And uh, boys clubs, they supported each other, that kind of stuff. But as long as women's traditional work was considered an outgrowth of female physiology, which there is some truth there. So uh, men can't have kids. <laughs> So women can, men can't feed the kids like women can at first. So it seems almost natural that women should look after them. Um, <clears throat> and that was probably extended beyond uh, what is absolutely biologically necessary. Right. Uh, and that, that's, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess that's where we just started. Uh, just thinking about it. Anyway. Um, yeah, so there's, there's probably some biological essentialism there, but it doesn't have to be beyond uh, two steps like birth and breastfeeding, right? If it's not bad, uh, there's there's no biological determinism. Um, yeah. But the rules make it that way. Uh, so she goes on now to talk about a little bit of the history or, well, what it is that she, we're talking about. First of all, it's called the United Nations System of National Accounts, UNSNA. It's a set of rules and methods used today to produce, to measure production and growth. All that it counts are monetary transactions it makes possible, okay? So economic reports, <coughs> governments, non-government organizations, world bodies like the UN, the International Monetary Fund, the Bank of International Settlements, the World Bank, and multinationals of all kinds use the Nation United Nations system of national accounts to plan, to analyze, to direct resources, and to legitimate policy. This is huge. Right. If you're using, if all the big players in the world are using this system to plan, analyze, and direct resources and legitimate policy, um, this is, in her mind, the single biggest um, source of. Well, she's going to call it neo-colonialism in the next in, in the next session, but um, of hmm. hegemonic control over people. Uh, we talk about cultural imperialism. Oh, I uh, lost your. Lost your audio. <clears throat> I 
Yeah, I can't hear you. Shoot. Hey guys, anybody in the chat? We'll just wait till Jeff gets back. We talk about cultural imperialism. Is he gonna say mathematical imperialism? Measurement imperialism? Tyranny of metrics? <clears throat> Okay, Jeff is switching his computers. Do do do. I'll just skip this part. I need a haircut. It's way too long up here. It's weird looking at yourself backwards with the camera. There we go. Uh, oh. I'm hearing there's something, some weird electronic sound that keep, that's intermittently. It unfortunately is the fan on the computer. That's the fan? It's on permanently. Did you say intermittent? Uh, well, it's like fading in and out. Maybe that's your noise canceling function doing that. Is that better? Uh, How about that? That's worse. That's worse? Okay. I don't know. Phones in. What if I take them off? What does this sound like? Can you hear me now? Is it better or worse? Uh, it's still intermittent. It's like coming in and out. Okay, back to here. Uh, I can, I can still hear it. 
fan's microphone from here. The, the fan on your... Is it a laptop? It's a laptop. Uh, could you try physically hitting the laptop where the fan is? This is a relatively new computer. It's a new computer and it's making that sound? No, about a year and a half. Still, that's... All right, well, I guess we'll just have to talk over it. All right, so, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, well, I, th I think we'll just have to <laughs> have to deal with it for now. Um, uh, okay, so. You're uh, you, the last thing you said was cultural hegemony or something, and then you were going to, or imperial. Yes, so the, the, um, the United Nations system of national accounts is, in fact, a form of cultural imperialism or neocolonialism. Um, that is, oh man, I'm hearing an echo now. Just a second. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I'm not hearing an echo. If that's okay with you, I'll go this way. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so it's a form of cultural imperialism that uh, excludes any unpaid labor, such as homemaking, childcare, or social reproduction, um, which has traditionally been overwhelmingly been considered women's work. What is also excluded are any other values which we do not have a price for, such as beauty, cleanliness, naturalness of the environment, and any free gifts of nature are considered valueless, yet contradictorily, their remediation has value according to the system. Right, so there's lots of things that we actually value in life that aren't priced, which kind yes. of negates the whole logic of market capitalism. Yes, or at least a system of national accounts. So I don't know if she's entirely against capitalism, but she is certainly against the, uh, the system of national accounts as it stands today. Uh, she goes on to say that the, due to the overwhelming presence of men and their writings, of their experiences, nearly the whole field of economics has been a major contributor, perpetrator, and apologist for this dominant worldview. And this is a quote from her. Women who must listen to, read, discuss, use, and write about this sort of thinking daily for four years, she's talking about uh, economic students, um, knowing that their degree and their job security are dependent on perpetrating this ideology are likely to lose sight of themselves. The discipline offers no relief, holds no, up no mirrors to women's experience. So um, the system essentially makes women, forces women to be blind to their own particular uh, existential uh, belief or experience because it imposes, uh, well, they need to get their degree and they need to keep their job. And that often means that you sell your soul in a sense. So, so going back to the Margaret Thatcher comment that you made earlier. Um, this would explain perhaps why she was acting more like a man than most men. Right. So she's forced. She's forced to in order to further her career, is what yes. Emily's saying. But so, but but she's saying that in in particular, the field of economics uh, affects women um, or blinds them even more so because it's the one that that directly ignores the. Uh, uh, the role of uh, uh, reproduction, social reproduction. Yes. Whereas, was other things like I don't know, being a being in the army as a woman, or or being in some other men's men's field, wouldn't isn't this isn't quite the same. That's correct. So, so uh, say squeezing more productivity out of people. Uh, for the same or less pay is the primary way of increasing profits for existing enterprises. So she points out that new market expansions and game-changing innovations are few and far between compared to efficiency and productivity gains. Right. So we we often we have a confirmation bias. We often feel that uh, oh look at this person developed this great new thing like say the iPhone or the smartphone or something like that, and we laud that as a wonderful thing. And it is. He says that this is a great thing. Uh, often, not communicating properly. But the fact is that most productivity gains are not from new markets, but from existing markets. More more um, exploiting more perfect uh, more perfectly the existing labor supply. So uh, she gives an example. 
When Disney entered the amusement park industry, one of its innovations was to have smartly dressed, smiling attendants. Other amusement parks needed to start demanding the value that this affective labor created. But she points out it's unlikely that they got a raise just to smile more. Um, bosses often say, well, you know, you have to do your job this way. And they're not going to pay you more. They're, they say they're already paying you for it. This right. affective labor uh, was a major benefit to Disney and forced everybody else to follow suit. But this nobody paid more, but more productivity was generated because more people wanted to go to amusement parks. Be because of the smartly dressed uh, attendants? And the smile. She, she's emphasizing the smile. So smartly dressed might have been part of like they got uniforms, whereas in the past people wore blue jeans or something. I don't know. And they weren't uniform. But you have somebody smiling at you. Welcome to Disney. Uh, which is like a ride. Uh, it's better than hey, come on, on. Get so on. as a, as opposed to the carnies from of uh, other amusement parks or fairs or whatever the town fair. Yeah. yeah. And this is this generated increased productivity because it brought more people to it. Disney was very popular, but did they get a major raise as a result? Exceedingly unlikely. No, they didn't. So they, they did not benefit from the productivity increased productivity that they created. Right. And this is overwhelmingly how our system works. We squeeze more and more productivity out of people. This happens all the time in every industry, whereas game changers are few and far between. This is the dominant model for growth in our economy, according to her. Squeezing more, well, yes, but then how does she deal with the falling rate of profit? <laughs> well, she doesn't get into that at this point because um, the falling rate of profit is transferred to rents. That's a, that's a quick answer. Um, profits and rents are considered two different things. And um, if you were to consider them the same, there's no falling rate of profit. In fact, it's getting... It's getting better for everybody, or for the people who own the means of production. Right. So it's just they're just being collected in different ways, rather than through exploitation of labor. They're being collected through rents more so, and in, in, yes, in so other areas. Production, yes, but they're still exploited exploitation of labor. She doesn't deny that for a second. Um, okay. Anyway, so uh, furthering on with the uh, history of the um, United Nations system of national accounts, she claims it's a system which acts to sustain in ide the ideology of patriarchy, the universal enslavement of women and Mother Earth in their reproductive and productive activities. Profession, the profession of economics is that of a limited social group, economically privileged, university educated, university educated white men. It serves neither the majority of humankind nor our fragile planet. Its structure and content have a design and a beguiling propaganda. That's her word, a beguiling propaganda. So she does claim that uh, it is a form of enslavement. Uh, the notion of wage slavery uh, came later, but for her, um, the notion of not counting women and forcing them to work, and we'll see many examples of that in the next little while, uh, not today, but in the next few sessions. Um, makes that incredibly clear, and we'll see that a little bit later. It's real, it's literally enslavement. Um, but you asked us that it's possible to actually imagine a different world. So she means the, ins uh, the enslavement uh, of the proletariat, or does she mean in, ter uh, in terms of what women do in the, in the household? In the household. So this is beyond proletariat. She's, uh, she, um, I get the impression. These are the, these are the background conditions that, that make the proletariat and capitalist production even, even possible. Is this yes. the background work that women do as slaves? This is what she's saying in the uh, productive uh, or reproductive sphere. Yes. And women, in a sense, are slaves. Um, the definition, of course, of a slave is somebody who works without getting paid, and somebody else benefits from that. Men benefit a lot from that, women are enslaved. Or, or even even just the system, capital or cap, capital itself benefits from, women, uh, yeah, ma women's unpaid labor. Right. So she points out that people believe that there's nothing that can be done to fix the world, or um, certainly nothing on their own. Um, but this is part of that beguiling propaganda designed to keep the patriarchy and its values dominant in the world. The result will be that if we really can't imagine anything beyond this, we're going to be stuck here on uh, the exploitation and enslavement 
um, will continue. So uh, I promise you now that there will be a, she's going to offer a solution, an amelioration first, and then a solution uh, towards the end, which will be in three se the second session after this. Okay. So getting back to the history, the United Nations System of National Accounts is in fact the latest in attempts to measure what is valuable in economic terms. It has proven very useful in justifying public policy and in fact, due to its selective and incomplete facts, the system predetermines what policies are even thinkable. And we're gonna see an example from that she had. She was also, by the way, a legislator in the New Zealand um, uh, Parliament. And oh, wow. we'll see that in a few minutes. Um, its information serves not to teach, but to legitimize a methodology that regenerates its own system. And here's your quote. The system has become accepted as so self-evident that it is hard to realize that someone had to invent it. And that, that's like a major key for her. Our system of national accounts is not natural. It was, in fact, invented by somebody. And she gives a name, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, stone, I believe, he, uh, somebody's stone. Um, but he had a lot of help and he built up on a lot. But the important thing is that the system was invented. It didn't have to be this way and it, that means that it can be changed. It can be changed radically and still work. So she, so, uh, so, so, so she, she sees it as the system of natural, I mean, of national accounts as being the core of women's oppression or so and subjugation rather than the class system itself yes or the rather than capitalism itself yes well wait a minute but then how does she explain how does she explain that you know the system of natural uh, national accounts is only 100 years old or less how women were still exploited just the same before no they were exploited differently before even under capitalism oh yes so okay okay i mean <laughs> so um so exploitation has been happening for a long time but which uh, but in this sense the system itself the the system of national accounts can can if it's imagined properly or invented properly de-enslave women okay right okay so that's a big claim and uh, we're going to see a solution for her uh in the uh, near the end okay okay <laughs> so build up the suspense all right uh, uh so continuing on with her history so various schemes have been around since antiquity uh she points out that in ancient sparta they used huge iron rods to measure value um they weren't actually they were sort of like money then that they measured value but nobody actually moved them around or anything like that so it was to help bartering and set the number of chickens are equal to the number of cows or something Yes. Then she goes on to um, say uh, more modern attempts started in 1665 with a guy named Sir William Petty. Then in France, a guy named Francois Cunzet started what she called the um, Tableau Economique, which uh, was meant to create this self-sufficient country, France, that would continue to grow bigger and bigger and be able to dominate all its, um, its rivals. Uh, then to Adam Smith, who divided the world into... Um, those who benefit, or those who uh, collect rents, landlords, those who sell their labor, the laboring class, and capitalists, or um, mass manufacturers, who collect profit. Uh, all of these things were attempts to try and understand where value comes from. And then she goes on to John Maynard Keynes. Mm -hmm. um, it points out that they're all well-off, dead white men uh, describing their experiences. And something happened in 1909. Income from market activity became the de facto definition of income. Okay. Now, the reason that this happened was that it was easier to count. No other reason than it was easier to count. So if you were trying to measure income prior to 1909, you had to figure out what's the value of this chicken, what's the value of this uh, farm product or whatever, these bushels of wheat, that kind of stuff. But they, they sort of realized, hey, if we just count only what's transacted in market, we can count it based on the actual transaction value, based on the change. Not in a barter system, but the money. And that became the de facto one because it was easy. So this was lazy man's uh, way to, yes. to count, to measure global activity. 
Exactly. Part of the reason that the market has become dominant is because economists, statisticians, and uh, I guess the uh, bureaucracy of, uh, of, a na of a nation were lazy and didn't want to count chickens. They wanted to count dollars or gold or whatever the currency was at the time. Okay, so that was, that was a major innovation in 1909 that she points out as being rather lazy. It was a lazy innovation, a way of saving things and uh, excluding a whole bunch of other things. However, she quotes, if we are concerned solely with market measurements, we are unable to establish the true living conditions as opposed to average standard of living of a population. Okay, what this means is that um, income for market activity became the standard of national accounts in Great Britain. And then, by the way, this was only in Great Britain in 1909. Compared to today, the amount of market activity in 1909 was negligible. What she's claiming is that because that's what we started counting, that's where the focus began. began. So that's where we, we cut off they cut off the idea of counting anything else. Yes. So everything else became either subservient to the market or not important. Okay. Um, she'll point out that uh, some things there were a few holdovers, as we'll see, but they might have even been closer to the reality prior to 1909 in Britain. But in okay. Britain, having empire pretty much at the time, this being before the First World War, um, pretty much exported it out. Exported so, this, the system of national accounts? Well, at this point, the, the notion that we should just use the market, uh, market exchange rates. Now, something happened. After the First World War, uh, there were tweaks to make to it. The most notable one was by Nazi Germany. Okay, so you got to remember, Nazi Germany lost the First World War. It was it suffered well, Germany, Germany, Germany. Not lost. It wasn't Nazi Germany yet. Okay, well Germany lost, but okay, uh, the Nazis were eventually. But uh, Germany lost the First World War. They had hyperinflation. They were invaded by France. They suffered the Great Depression just as much as everybody else did. And yet, in spite of all of those adversaries. They were able to remilitarize, such that it took the combined well, uh, the combined power, pretty much the rest of the world, Russia, the Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union at that time, um, partly, the Soviet, yeah, the Soviet Union, um, Britain, uh, and America, Canada, of course, and the Commonwealth, uh, to subdue them. I mean, they walked over France, who had invaded them a little while ago. They pretty much took over everything, and they did a. Um, from an objective perspective, they got pretty far in conquering all of Europe, right? And they did it with very, very little preparation. Understand? What she's yeah. saying is that the Nazis changed the system of national account to privilege material war production. By privileging material war production, they were able to, in a very short time, Developed weapons that were the best in the world. So their Luftwaffe and their battleships, they were much better than anything Britain or America had. America had to copy them to get better ones. The Japanese copied them to get better ones. But they took everything to a new level. And they were able, you're saying they're able, or she's saying they're able to do this because they of their accounting? Do, yes, because of their accounting. Huh. They privileged material more production. So if you're counting as valuable um, chickens or coffee shops or um, the production of uh, effective labor, like how much uh, happiness you're creating, um, people will get into that because that's where the money is. But if you're counting, if you're not counting any of that, you're only counting um, mass industrialization for the possibility of making tanks, for example, that's where the money is, that's where you will invest. So they were able to reindustrialize, despite the fact that they suffered huge amounts of inflation and invasion, um, and had the country cut up and tied to a, to a small core. Um, and, you know, they were a very small country relative to uh, all the ones around them, and in population they were shrunk down too. But they were able to expand out and actually spread in the rest of the world. She says it's because of that privileging material war production which had not ever existed before. They were the first to do that. Well, okay. Yeah. This is. Okay, this uh, is the was to, so um, the first thing was to in 1909 was by Britain was to 
um, privilege only market exchange rates. Yeah. Market exchanges. Whatever else was being counted was everything in the market. But then the national accounts started to priv in Germany started to privilege huge manufacturing. So that's where money became available. So today, for example, we can find tons of money for bridges, but very little for healthcare unless there's a pandemic. Right. Unless there's a financial crisis. Money can be found for what the system considers important. And that is determined by the national accounts. What do they privilege and what do they not? And it's never a direct thing like here it says in line four of the national accounts, we're going to privilege material war production. No, you look at the policies that are set out in that thing, where the banks are allowed to lend money at lower interest rates relative to higher interest rates. Right? Where uh, if, you, if you're granting um, war producers or uh, mass man or manufacturers of uh, heavy industry uh, loans at 0% or even negative percent and you're lending people, um, homeowners or home buyers uh, at positive percentages or 10% or 20%, people are not going to buy homes as much as they're going to try and invest in building war machines. So then would she argue that, say, you know, the USSR in the 1940s um, did the same thing as Hitler and changed their system of national accounts in order to yes. stimulate the war production there? Yes, they did. And in fact, America did that too. And she points out how there was huge debates in, in, the, in Congress about how they could not pay for the war. They didn't want to get into the war, partly because they felt they couldn't pay for it. Then somebody, a guy named... Stone, I forget his first name, proposed a change to their national accounts based closer on the German Nazi model. And suddenly it became very easy to pay for it. And it what, was. So, what, what, what was the specific changes that made these, these so, things possible? Uh, I haven't read the act. She claims to have, uh, but essentially, you can, she claims that you can see that it was a shift to material war production. Whereas but I mean, anybody can shift their economy to yes, create the point is that anybody can shift it, but unless there's an incentive to do it, you won't get it done. So, for example, right now in this crisis, um, we have a shortage of, um, of masks, right? Yeah. So the government is putting out a ton of money to get manufacturers to convert and build that stuff that we need, right? It's not the market that's doing it. It's it's government. It's essentially they're taking the, the surplus money that they can essentially create um, and saying, we will give you this money as opposed to lend it to you. So let me ask you this. Are you going to, prior to this pandemic, are you going to uh, invest in making masks? You don't see any reason for it. Government suddenly gives you money, start investing, retool whatever you're doing, do it now and you get this money. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, but that just, that just sounds like fiscal policy rather than policy is a major part of it but even within fiscal policy if there's assumptions that are made that uh, intensive industry high uh, great amounts of industry um, material production that can be used uh, for war so whenever you see regulations coming out of, uh, of government uh, they say we're gonna do this we're gonna do this we're gonna do this we're gonna do this so right now in the COVID um, pandemic we're talking about uh, giving breaks to landlords not so much for tenants, right? Yeah. It's a privilege right there. Who's going to survive more easily? Um, yeah. there's, there's that, that would be a, a micro example of a very selected uh, privileging that's supported in the system. And she says it's, it's not, uh, well, she's labeling it as material war production, but you won't see that anywhere. As you look through uh, the places where you can uh, uh, offer low interest loans or no interest loans or just grants, you can see what the government at that moment in time is thinking. And it's privileging, she's claiming, material war production even today. So we look at national accounts that is essentially based on the Nazi system of national accounts. Wow. Okay. So this is okay. Richard Stone, that was the guy. Richard Stone adapted the existing system in order to organize the economy to pay for World War II. This guy was an American. Uh, he was British, but uh, the Americans copied him. And it was the Americans who insisted on their system becoming the United Nations system of national accounts. So you can see how it traveled first from Britain to Germany, back to Britain and then to the United States, 
and the United States essentially has spread it all over the world through the United Nations. So if a third world country wants, um, wants funds from the United States or during the Marshall Plan, they had to adjust their economy to accept the system of national, uh, national unit accounts that America had set up, because that's how they were going to decide how much money you got. And if these countries said, no, no, we're going to do it our own way, well, we don't get any American money because we can't analyze it that way. Right. 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 And, that, and that's an account counting system that privileges uh, 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 more production. Yeah. Well, and, and the states that are that are doing that the, the most already, like like yes. the U.S. and the core capitalist countries. Yes. So uh, and material production was, in fact, paramount. So effective labor in material production, like education, much less. So uh, war machines, you could get money for only afterwards did the GI Bill come in, that's because they, have, they had to find some way to, to educate them or do something. Everything is in the service of being able to mobilize people and production for a particular war effort. And we even talk about that today, the war on terror, the war on drugs, the war on the COVID-19 virus. Um, that is not an accident. It's a relatively new thing in our history. Um, there's always been wars, but to label the idea of a war on terror, war on drugs, <laughs> war on viruses, um, that's very modern and it stems from this notion that if it's a war that you're fighting, you can get funds. That's right. an implicit uh, thing that's in the national accounts, even today. Um, so the war was the priority at that time and war production is still the priority. The welfare of people was a distant secondary, even if it's existing concern. And we can still see that today even in the United States. Teachers are very poorly paid. Um, the healthcare system uh, is, well, they put a lot of money into it, but it's privatized in a sense so that it can be marshaled in a different direction if necessary. Yeah. So their ideas, uh, and just to be clear, the national income, okay, she, she claims that it's disseminated, uh, the, the original paper was called the National Income and Expenditure of the United Kingdom and how to pay for the war. It originally changed it in, in um, Britain. The US in June, 1943, uh, this system, this paper allowed Roosevelt to get a war budget to appear feasible and passed through Congress where the older model would not have allowed the war expenditures to appear feasible. That's their claim. Ah. And it was by changing that, essentially cooking the books with different priorities that allowed the war to become profitable and feasible. After the war, this paper was the foundation of Stone's work with the United Nations in developing the United Nations system of national accounts. And it is the system that we now that has now been deployed virtually everywhere on every nation on earth. So, and that's how it was invented. That's her history of how the system of national accounts was invented. Thank you, Nazis. Yes, but not so much thank you, Nazis, as the fact that it was America who decided, yeah, we're going to spread this over the world. I mean, the proper thing to do would have been when the war is over, that's not... Let's not privilege um, material war production. But the fact that they continued with that was the problem. Right. Well, with this threat of Stalin and the Soviet Union, I think the, the United States thought they were, were going to be in, a, in for a, a long haul in war production war, for a they while. They created that because they kept on producing more material and they, were, they kept on being in that production mode. And I suspect. That's probably more to it than that, and then the other one, because <laughs> well, she gives a lot more evidence of that in the book. Okay. Okay, so the United Nations System of National Accounts is a system designed to win a war with war material production. The size of a country's GDP is indicative of the resources that can be potentially or are directed to a war effort. So um, just because you're making pens or gas masks or... Um, or uh, phones or something like that, doesn't mean that you're necessarily producing war, but you have organized resources that can be directed towards a war effort. If, you're, um, if you never had that factory that made, uh, say, vitamins or wallets or statues or whatever it is that you want to make, that would be unorganized. But by organizing it, it becomes part of what can be drafted or marshaled for a war effort. And GDP is indicative of the resources that can be moved in that direction. If the manufacture of consumer products is indicative of resources that can be retooled and repurposed to fight a war. 
and the United Nations system of national counts has no ability, or at least a humble ability, to measure reproduction, poverty, well-being, um, equality, or any form of immaterial production or value. That's it, it. It's almost impossible, and in some cases, it's just poorly done because we're focusing in on material war production. So consider also consumer spending. It's a measure of the money that can be taxed or excised to help direct a future war effort. So during this COVID uh, crisis that we have, they're talking about direct infusion to people to help them survive this issue and keep on with this kind of stuff. The same thing could be done instantly in a, in a war situation. Suddenly, we will take all the money out of your bank accounts and we will only pay you if you join the army. Right, so that, that can't... Yep, say again? So that, that could be something that's done. Yes, that's exactly something that can be done. That's why the GDP is important. All the money that exists in the country can be taken, redistributed in an existential crisis such as a war, essentially saying, you are not important, you are. I don't care if you're a doctor, you're going to join the army now. I don't care if you're a computer scientist, we want you on a gun at the front lines. And we will, as an indication of how much motivation can be put on people. So remember, one of the things that tool of money is to create a motivation to do things that you wouldn't normally want to do. Right. Right. So you have a nice high paying job. Suddenly, um, you have to stay home because of a virus. Uh, if they don't offer you, you know, support, you're going to look out for something else to do. Then they're going to offer you something else. Hey, join the army. We need you on the front lines. They may have a whole propaganda thing and they pay you and they look after your family for you. Suddenly you are motivated to go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is the purpose of consumer spending, to measure how much is available, to motivate people to do things they wouldn't normally want to do, and it can be repurposed pretty much on the, on, on the fly because we're concerned with material war production. Now, I wonder what would she, would, she would have to say for COVID-19 and kind of the America and Trump's weird response to the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, well, they're still much more concerned. Okay, so uh, I think they're much more concerned with material war production than perhaps Canada is. So we've made some slight improvements, but I think that she would say that uh, we've only made slight improvements. We haven't made any whole scale changes. Um, but uh, Trump hasn't invoked the, or maybe he just did just recently, the, the uh, War Production Act or the whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Where they where where he can marshal officially marshal companies to do work for him. Yeah, he's well, he was he was, uh, he, uh, he was uh, ra um, ranting against General Motors and said, you know, you got to start building some more of these uh, gas masks or something instead of cars. And now it's official. Yeah, so he's essentially hinting what was happening. So now you have a car company um, retooling to make masks. That's yeah, sort of war material thinking. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so those are the two things. So the actual um, physical factories and uh, places of work, as well as the actual money in the system, can be retooled, repurposed to incentivize and actually build what is needed. And that is why countries or America is very concerned with the increase in GDP of China, a competitor, and Russia, like a former rival, rather than uh, allies like Britain or France, because it's an indication of how much resources can be marshaled in, in uh, directed towards a war effort. Yeah. It's what it's all about. And against them. Pardon? Yeah, and, and against the interests of, of the United States. Yes. So at this moment, we've got a very clear way of saying who's going to win a war. But look at the GDP. The one with the higher GDP has got, in our system of national accounts, um, the clear advantage in any war. And right now, that's America. And China so, is catching up and that's why America is worried. And so this this is a new phenomenon, is what she's saying. That that before a country's productive activities w were not wouldn't it would not be the ter determining factor in a war? Uh, it wouldn't be the same as they are today. It would be uh, usually a, a question of how many men you had. Uh, right, your standing army was, and your ability to manufacture uh, guns. But the number of subsistence farmers, not important. Today, 
we've gotten rid of subsistence. <laughs> Probably a good thing. But we've essentially made uh, our, yeah, subsistence farmer, for example, would need to be forcefully taken from his land in order to join the army or to be forced to join the army. So yeah. We do it voluntarily by taking away the opportunities and offering a different opportunity. Well, right. That's that's primitive accumulation and capitalism. In yeah. a nutshell. In a nutshell. Um, so what she's claiming there is that um, in between wars, uh, the counting of the GDP helps determine where everybody stands in um, the military pecking order. And this also means that much of economic discipline is a matter of perception. And what does and does not constitute production could depend on the way you see the world. And she's claiming that it does. The people, the hawks, as we say, um, insist that we live in a very dangerous world and we need to be prepared. She's going to say, you're well prepared. <laughs> You've got the largest ability to fight a war right now. And every, but it's the national accounts that builds this up. Right. China, yeah, naturally, having more population and bigger square footage area, feels that they should probably have a greater share of the world of the world pie than the Americans do. Americans disagree. They're probably going to get into um, the system. Of national accounts is probably is, is sort of aiming towards each other. Right, right. It's it's reckoning it's, someday soon. It's perpetuating and re reinforcing this this uh, clash of, of of powers towards towards military action. Yes, precisely. And likely it will continue, uh, and there will probably be a war sometime. Um, Fun. Yeah. No. no well, in the most sarcastic way possible. Yes. Uh, so again, the system was designed to marshal productive forces to fight and win wars, and it is therefore not likely the best economic system for people or for peacetime. Right. Mm -hmm. So this worldview that is in fact created by the United Nations System of National Accounts, like all worldviews, privileges some groups and disadvantages others. It makes some notions appear self-evident and others unthinkable. So questions like what constitutes production and the relative placement of economic entities within or outside an arbitrary production boundary create the United Nations System of National Accounts' worldview. She, she, this is her term, the, an arbitrary production boundary. Right? What is considered productive and what is not? It's a boundary line. If you're in it, you, get, you make money, and if you're outside of it, you don't, or you make a lot less. You, you sort of get the scraps. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so consider the work done by a subsistence farmer. By subsistence farming, it's work. It keeps households alive. But since there's no surplus produ pro produced that could be directed towards market activity and therefore not for war effort, subsistence farming is outside the production boundary of the United Nations system of national accounts. Because there's no capital created. Yeah. There's no. There's no excess capital. But people are still living and people are still continuing and it's being reproduced. So imagine that. Unpaid labor falls outside this uh, production boundary. This boundary systematically excludes traditional women's work from the notion of productivity and production. And in fact, the only thing that is at the time of her writing, the only thing that uh, the United Nations System of National Accounts actually concerned itself with was fertility rates or the size of the economically inactive female reserve labor force. That's how it was apparently described in New Zealand. And Say that again? Say that again? The size of the economically inactive female reserve labor force. Inactive female reserve labor force. Okay. Yes. Successful. <laughs> now, what is that important for? Because if men have to go off and fight a war, somebody's going to need to um, build the machines that they use, right? Yes, yes. That's what women are valued for, or at least at the time that she wrote this, and in a sense they still are. If you are on productive labor, that means that you can be rounded up and put into work in a factory in the case of, uh, in the event of a war. Right, you're the reserve army, you're the, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, <laughs> that from her perspective, is the, is the problem in the world, is this, this notion that um, we are resources for the sake of war. Everything we do is... Yeah, but Okay, but then it's uh, it, I'm, I'm not sure she is going far enough. I mean, because what, what is the purpose of war? <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, she doesn't go into the purpose of war. It's, uh, in this world, uh, okay, she's also talking during the middle of the Cold War. Um, we're going to get into this briefly. Uh, mutually assured destruction. Uh, yeah, what is the value of mutually assured destruction? Because that's what she sees as the next war in 1986, would be a nuclear war, mm -hmm. the death of us all. Because, I mean, I mean, the materialist, you know, analysis would just say, okay, well, I mean, yeah, it, th this is all going towards the war economy, but what's the war economy for? It's for to, to keep the capitalist class um, in, in charge and keep the economy going. Um, it sort of keeps to, re to reproduce their own their own class interests. Yeah, that's uh, that'll fall right away if uh, if they're a threat to the <laughs> to the system. Um, they will expropriate anybody's material production abilities for the sake of the war effort. So uh, she she sees this, this she sees the state as the ultimate actor here. Uh, well, the state is both um, a tool of and a reinforcer of the system. So the state benefits from this because the people in the state are usually of the yeah. elite. The elites want a certain thing to be done. Their industry is whatever they're best at to continue to flourish. So, they're, so they, they, um, they move themselves into that box and then they defend that box. But they are in service, yes, but yeah, they're in service of the capitalist mode of production. Yes, but again, it depends. If they become a threat, they will be closed down. So, for example, in this COVID thing, restaurants not a th are not important. I mean, they, they become part of the threat to everybody else, so they're closed down right away, despite the fact that they are business owners and some of them are pretty wealthy. Right. Liquor stores, on the other hand, are clearly essential. Yeah, that's a strange one. <laughs> So um, it clearly shows where the values are of society as well as the power interests. But ultimately, if liquor, say the virus was transmitted through alcohol, liquor stores would be shut down right away. <laughs> that, I mean, that's true. Yeah. So um, I think she would say that the capitalist elite are tools who happen to have conformed themselves best to the existing system at any moment in time, but they will be sacrificed by the greater whole if they ever become a threat. So as an example, the oligarchs in uh, Putin's Russia, when they spoke against Putin, they were hammered and put away. They supported Putin, they protected. There is a mutual reinforcement there. Uh, yeah, yeah. I so right true. now, Landlords are not uh, hurting anybody, and in fact, uh, are not hurting the system, so they're going to be privileged. Renters, you know, they're part of the um, the uh, untrusted class, you could say. <laughs> and so, talking about giving um, breaks to landlords, it's first, and renters second, if at all. It explained, it's explained by the privileges that are in the system already. People with money are privileged over people without money. But... People who create out who are a threat are instantly shut down. Right. Okay. So where were they? So um, uh, this is useful for war production. For yeah, and essentially that's the end of the second session with this. Um, we live in a system that's essentially a Nazi utopia. <laughs> okay. So yeah, just uh, war production. Constant war production. War infinite, production. Infinite war production. Yes. Material war production. Okay. And we're starting to see some of the limits to that even now, but we're still spending tons of money on bridges and there's simpler solutions. Yeah. Yeah. True. Okay, so that's the that's the end of part one. Uh two, actually. There's eight parts or nine eight oh. parts. Even, so we can uh if we can do two per session, we'd have four week or four times to do this. Okay. A dense book, is it? Uh it's a pretty dense book, we're, we're pretty crazy. and it's also pretty thick. So, holy cow! Okay, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, hopefully we can get the sound issue uh, figured out, or your your other computer figured out for for next time. Mm -hmm. The sounds a lot worse on this computer than it was on the other one, but at least it's con it's like it's it doesn't cut out. Yeah, and I don't know. What, I'm not doing anything. I'm just like the way you say it. It seems like um. 
it just computer decides something in the background and the process in the background seems to start up and I can't tell what that is. Yeah, it's it's the, the microphone's a little sketchy and, and the, the sound of the fan is or whatever it is is humming along. But uh well if you, you know what if you if you rewatch through you'll be able to see or hear. Okay. All right. Well uh all right. Well, thanks for doing this and I guess uh wait, so are you are you is there no more um city council meetings? No, we are all on Zoom now, so I stand here where I'm standing with you and um put a tie on and uh, vote from far away and uh, pretty much everything is going to be done that way so I don't actually have to leave my apartment. But you're still you're still working though. <laughs> and in case you haven't noticed, um, part of the privileged view is that she's talking about yes. I get paid and not have to work. Yes, very nice. Um, and, well, what she's saying is that uh, this is a privileged position that uh, um, may be unfair or maybe everybody should be more like me, but we can do that if we change the system of national accounts. Uh, yes, indeed. That that is that would be that is the goal. All right. Uh, so two weeks from now. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, All right. Jeff. Thank you. Good night. Here.